Manage Pests, Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi, everyone. Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and don't forget to join us on Facebook for our Pest Geek Podcast family over there. Our group, talk about your trials, your triumphs, and just sort of chit-chat with fellow people within the wildlife control industry and the pest control industry. We're glad to have you join us. And so if you need to get a hold of me, if you have criticisms, yes, even criticisms, comments, suggestions for shows, perhaps you want to be on the show, or even advertise in our show, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Definitely reach out. We have a very special guest today. Well, I think all of our guests are, are certainly special, but this one is certainly one I'm glad to get because we did a previous podcast oh, several weeks ago at this point where we talked about baiting of feral hogs, where I reviewed a journal article from, I believe it was the Journal of Wildlife Management. Now we have some recent research that was done by Lee Williamson. So he's our guest. He is a wildlife biologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife, District 7, Region 4. And he has done some research that just came out at a uh, feral pig conference. I think it's called the Wild Pig Conference 2022. Uh, I like feral pig better, but I guess some people like wild pig. Anyways, he did some research on baiting, and we're glad to have him here to discuss the research that he did down there in Texas. So welcome, Mr. Williamson. We're really glad to have you on board here with the Living the Wildlife podcast. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah. So tell us, uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your your background, some of the research you, you've you done, you know, maybe for your degree when you got your, I'm assuming you have a master's or PhD. Oh, yes, sir. So yep. I got my undergrad degree at a small school called Austin College in East Texas, and I got my graduate degree studying elk at Texas State University. Okay. Um, most publications I did in graduate school actually focused on movement, habitat utilization, and forage habits of large ungulates like elk and mule deer in Northern California. Um, oh. after, shortly after finishing that degree, I got hired on with Texas Parks and Wildlife on the Feral Pig Project, which is a joint venture from uh, with the USDA and Texas Parks and Wildlife, trying to find better methods of reducing feral pig populations. Sure. Mostly through um, uh, chemical means, such as different kinds of um, mammal pesticides that have been developed in a few years. The research I mostly helped with had to do with uncovering differences in feral pig feeding habits with the goal of finding better ways of designing and deploying poisons to target pigs and not other wildlife. Okay, I wasn't aware you were involved in that. So are you involved in some of the kaput research then? Or are you working with the wildlife uh, services and their work with, um, I forgot the chemical uh, that they put in uh, meat to keep it from preserving, um, sodium nitrate. Exactly, sodium nitrite, technically. I nitrite, to, sorry, nitrate. nitrite. Uh, um, yes, I did research with a crew that's working on sodium nitrite, a pesticide which, been, which has been legalized in Australia and um, has been We've been refining uh, deployment techniques for that here in the United States, trying to find better ways to design not just the poison itself, but the deployment means of the box we put the poison in and when we would deploy it to not target things besides pigs. Um, so let's take a little sidebar. I know I brought you on here to talk about baiting of feral pigs, but you're fascinated. I didn't realize you were involved in some of this other work. So uh, I don't want to go too far afield, but do you have an, a sense that will, do you think sodium nitrite will be registered here in the U.S.? Or do you think that's, and by registered, I mean something, something that's going to be able to be used beyond wildlife services? Or do you think it's going to be registered just for wildlife services? So yeah, any thoughts on that? Just in my opinion, without getting too much into research that's uh, currently ongoing, I'm very confident that sodium nitrite is going to be approved for state and federal use very soon within the next few years wow. um, for, for seasonal use, of course. I don't think it'll yeah. ever be year-round use. As for private consulting companies, I'm not as confident in that, at least not in the next couple of years. Yeah. I do think once it's used by wildlife services and state authorities for five or six years, then I think the question will be open again. 
But that I certainly don't expect that to be approved in the next couple of years. Not at all. Probably, yeah. That that certainly. So it might be done on a trial basis for wildlife services just to let them continue to ref, to refine it. And so, it's the is the bugaboo the delivery system? In other words, the container is that because it seems like sodium nitrite is pretty. I mean, no, no pesticide is safe. I mean, so make sure everyone knows that no pesticide is safe. Uh, it is certain, but in terms of it, it's relatively low risk for a lot of wildlife is my understanding compared with, you know, um, warfarin. And I'm not throwing kaput under the bus. I was very proud of their their work with feral pigs on this issue. And we need, we need more of it. Um, but it was certainly on a, on a, milligram per kilogram basis, sodium nitrite was certainly a safer, in terms of its secondary poisoning and this sort of thing, it's certainly a safer product. Would that be true? So it's really the delivery system that's the bugaboo here in the U.S.? Absolutely. I would say, and you can find this in um, publicly peer-reviewed research in the Wildlife yeah. Society Bulletin and the Journal of the Wildlife Society and other manuscripts where this group tends to publish fairly often. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, sodium nitrite's fairly safe relative to many poisons for mm -hmm. other wildlife um the issue is not so much i guess it is somewhat the deployment the box itself is very well designed to only be accessible by pigs okay because it, it, it's a magnet controlled box right so it yeah. closes the magnets hold the lid shut and then it kind of relies on the pigs feeding behavior of rooting right they use their mm -hmm. nose to investigate right. everything so a pig would go up lift the lid with its nose and then be able to feed on the sodium nitrite that kind of relies on a behavior that's unique to pigs mm -hmm. right? and so with the box itself it's actually very well designed to only be accessible by pigs the oh okay is that pigs are sloppy eaters oh right so they're spilling it on the ground that makes it accessible exactly. oh right so uh well interesting well you know we have uh i think wildlife control operators are a very ingenious bunch and uh you might be surprised some of them might come up with their a better widget to take care of that maybe a little catch basin like they do with bird feeders sometimes that that will then recycle that back into the container uh, that type of spillage but nevertheless that's we're getting a little far afield but maybe we'll have you back to talk about the sodium nitrite work without a doubt but when I saw you on this uh, webinar, you were talking about your research that was dealing with finding that what we all look for is the magic bait, right? The one that just targets the one animal we want. It doesn't attract other animals that we don't want. And it just works like, uh, you know, a moth to light, <laughs> yeah. right? It just pulls them right in. So what were your findings that you, you did uh, describe the research that you were doing and then some of the results that you came out of that? So just to give a little context to this research. Mm -hmm. So as you said, we were focusing on trying to find a bait that was very effective for catching pigs, especially during times of year when corn is less effective. Um, anyone, you, of course, anyone else in wildlife management is aware um, corn is a very commonly used bait for catching pigs. It's economic, it's readily available, and it tends to, you can put it out and it's not going to spoil. You know, it's going to stay on the ground until something comes and eats it for the most part. Mm. Although, as anyone who's used that for an extended period of time is aware, there are certain times of year when corn seems to be less effective for trapping pigs. And that could be for a lot of reasons. Um, many have observed that corn is less effective during the acorn mast when oaks are dropping a lot of acorns. Um, corn baited traps are not as effective. During the deer season, when corn feeders are going off in states where that's very common, again, pigs are going to be a lot less likely to go into the trap with corn when there's just a feeder with corn in an open field. And also, uh, it's possible that as other food resources become available as well, um, corn becomes less attractive. When crops have been recently planted or are um, about to be harvested at those times of year, uh, a variety of different crops tend to be heavily targeted by pigs. And so we were trying to find a bait that would be resilient across all these different adverse circumstances and still attract pigs when all these other things were going on. And with that in mind, we took a variety of baits that have been used by wild pig controllers in the past. Uh, we took a variety of uh, food crops that are commonly targeted by wild pigs. And also just some different food resources that pigs have been documented as eating, but haven't really been tested before for baiting wild pigs. So we took up from many different sources for the baits used for this trial. And so we had how things that- Do you have an idea how many you tested, how many different baits you did test during this study? We did a total of 
in the actual study, seven different baits. We did seven a couple of baits, baits in both the spring and the fall. Okay. And so if, if I could just give a quick summary of the study design for mm -hmm. this experiment. Yeah, essentially, okay. after selecting our list of baits that we selected from, we essentially got um, about 120 pigs across the two seasons, separated them into groups of three, and then each season we ran four subsequent five-day trials. In each of these five-day trials, each group of three pit pigs was put in a pen where there were two feed troughs. There was a reference feed trough, which, as you may have guessed, was corn, because we're comparing all these baits to corn, right? And then there was a test feed trough. And then, of course, a water trough and enough space to move around. Pigs were given enough feed that they could feed ad libitum across this entire five-day period. Um, during this time, we also had cameras collecting photos in each of these pens to monitor the pig's behavior. And so doing this across the two seasons and making sure no group of pigs got the same test bait twice, so they were always naive to the test bait, we collected data on essentially the ratio of test feed eaten to corn eaten. So that was used to generate a, what we call the preference value for the test bait. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then we also used that photo data to collect the number of times pigs visited each of these bait troughs over the five day period because we felt that gave a more, there's a difference between feed preference and bait attractiveness, right? And so we wanted to get a more a better picture of which bait was getting more activity, not just which bait was getting consumed more heavily. And so we use that camera data to get counts and so, to see how the counts of pigs visiting each trough varied over the five day period and varied between different baits. And so that was the overall design of the study. The baits we used for the spring trial. So, and to give a little context, the spring in Texas tends to be a little warmer, a little more rainy, especially in central Texas. The baits we used during that time were dried mealworms, soybeans, split peas, and peanuts still in the shell. The four baits we used for our fall trials were, I'm sorry, earthworms mixed with a little bit of potting soil, live oak acorns gathered from areas around central Texas, peanuts again, and then also oat grow, it's essentially oatmeal. We used peanuts in both seasons, um, mostly because peanuts seemed to be a little more effective in the spring trials than the other test baits. And so we wanted to see if they were at least as effective in the fall trials as well. So that's why we used the, um, the um, same bait from both seasons. So that was the general design of the study. And, of the, so the seven baits, so that's where the seven baits come from then. And did you, and you chose these because of their, uh, because you had some research that showed that pigs were eating these products, of course, these, these materials, and that you saw that there was at least some pref, uh, some does preference for them, or was it a volume, was it also a cost value in there that you were looking for as well, that you weren't going to go something obscure, like sometimes in trapping you'll get something like civet oil or something which is really an obscure animal <laughs> uh, oil that can be quite expensive to use is, is that part of the mix as well or were you just looking at attractiveness cost cost be damned well as you can imagine when we started telling people about this research we got dozens and dozens of bait <laughs> suggestions that we could use everything from donuts to just corn mixed with diesel, which is very commonly used, of course, to uh -huh. bacon. All kinds of things were suggested. The bacon seemed a little morbid to me personally, but that was, <laughs> that, that was pretty commonly suggested. <laughs> the baits that we did select for this study, for the most part, were selected because they were economic and could, they had similarities to corn in that okay. they could be purchased from a feed vendor, put out into a trap and set there for a bit and essentially be economically used to catch pigs okay, okay the obvious exceptions to this are the live oak acorns and the earthworms right right we went with the live oak acorns because as i mentioned earlier we kind of wanted to take a look at how food competition impacted pig attractiveness to corn as i mentioned earlier a lot of wildlife managers have observed that when oak trees are dropping acorns, pigs don't go into traps as much. So we wanted to see how that manifested in this study as well. We selected earthworms because up until a little more recently, there wasn't a lot of really good evidence that pigs really consumed a lot of soil arthropods. Like most folks had an idea that they were, but because of the way we conduct these pig, you know, 
fecal analyses and gut studies and stuff, it was really hard to actually collect data on that. But more recent research using mRNA barcoding has found that soil arthropods really do make a significant portion of pig's diet, at least during certain times of year. During times of year, precipitation is higher and these soil arthropods are more available. And so we just kind of gave that a shot. We wanted to kind of add to the body of literature that kind of gave some evidence that pigs really do consume these arthropods readily. Yeah, the the live oak acorns, I mean, yeah, I would understand that it's maybe hard for, for someone to collect those in bulk. However, it's certainly possible for someone to do an extract on those and maybe make a fake live oak. I mean, you can certainly get acorn oil. I mean, there are people who distill uh, vegetative products and create essential oils out of them. And that's certainly, do you think that, that the pigs are attracted to the odor of the acorns as well? Or do you think it's the meat substance that they're, that's pulling them to the trap? In other words, because we don't care if they feel nutritious after they're eating, if they're attracted to it, they're still inside the trap. I think there's a lot to it. I think there's, I think the biggest thing is that a pig's natural feeding habit is to kind of root through the ground as, as you know, and as many wildlife managers have noted, you're usually gonna find acorns either on the surface of the soil or just a little bit below the litter layer. And so that's kind of where pigs tend to look for most of their food. And so when they find a lot of acorns there, they're going to keep going for acorns. I got you. Pigs are also very habit forming creatures. You know, if you can follow pig movement over a long period of time, failing any significant disturbance, pigs tend to follow a pretty, a, a schedule, if you know what I mean. They tend to cover the same areas at different times of year. And I think pigs kind of, younger pigs, when they're, you know, with older members of the sounder tend to pick up on older members of the sounder eating those acorns, you know, and I think it's kind of a learned behavior as well. Um, I don't think an oil extract would be very effective for attracting okay. pigs. Okay. And so now that you've, you've done this work, so it occurred over a, a year period of time. So you had to house, this is a pen study with a choice test. I like that choice test. I think that has, that really gives us an idea. Of, can you explain a little bit further when I heard your concept about the preference data versus the, diff, the visiting data? I was intrigued by that because I don't think that's a concept that I've heard when I've taught, when I've heard people in the wildlife control industry talk about which bait is more effective. So could you kind of unpack the differences and what, and what meaning you're deriving from that particular data? Because I think that's something analogous for other types of bait. And perhaps we need to think differently about our baiting systems and other, with other wildlife animals as well. Right. And so we kind of, we thought that measuring bait attractiveness versus just bait preference might kind of more mimic a trapping situation in a real world setting for wildlife managers. Mm -hmm. What kind of birthed that idea in our brains was reading a study on domestic pigs, actually. So there's been a lot of research going on about how to put on weight for weaned piglets as quickly as possible, because following weaning, piglets don't tend to take to, you know, oats and corn and stuff so easily. So there's been a lot of study trying to find diets that are effective for helping piglets in that stage where they first start weaning from, from their sows. Mm. And so what this research has found is that while there's some feeds that a piglet will eat more of once it goes to it, those are not necessarily the same feeds as the feeds that the piglets are more willing to approach and feed from often, if that makes sense. Yeah, and what no. this research is finding is that it's actually these feeds that the piglets take two more quickly and visit more often that are more effective for putting weight on these piglets. Mm. And so reading that research and kind of thinking about it, we decided that we could see the same in our study as well, just because pigs consume more of a certain bait than another, they might've done that over just a couple visits. And if you're a trapper, you want pigs visiting your trap as often as possible. Right. right. And so that's kind of where we got that concept from, if that makes right. sense. No, I like it because there's a debate in our industry whether like like when I was in wildlife control as a as a commercial operator, I I would not chum the animal into the trap. So some people like to chum it. So they will have bait outside the cage and then sort of walk it in and then have the prize behind the treadle, right? So behind usually using cage traps. Um, where I I wouldn't do that because I was like, you know, you want it, you're going to have to commit and you got to go all the way in to go get it. And so that brings up this issue of preference versus volume issue. And so for my type of baiting, 
I'm not saying it's the best. It's just what I did. Mm. I would want a preference bait because it would force them to go in because whether they liked it or ate a lot of it didn't matter. I got them to step on the treadle and they were already inside. It's too late for them to realize. But if you're, if you're chumming them in, you have to have something that they're wanting to consume in volume because they're going to be getting a few pieces before they get to the big prize. So, yeah. I, yeah. I think what we're, a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Hello. One, one moment, sir. Sure. I'm oh, sorry, sir. I'll have to give you a call back. Um, yeah, well, as you were noting earlier, um, with your statement about the acorns and the, uh, extracting acorn oil as a possibility for a bait, it's the overall attractiveness of the bait that trappers are looking for, right? And so some baits might be more odorous than others well, and things like that. So yeah, for sure. So did you come up with any conclusions after your study? So you did this pretty intensive study. Who was, who's funding it? Was this done by Wildlife Services funding? It was mostly funded by the USDA um, yep. Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Okay, so APHIS, all right. Very happy I got that acronym right on the first try. And yeah, yep, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, that's right, yep. So they provided funding and labor um, for the study, uh, along okay. with TPWD also providing funding in most of the labor. And the biggest findings from the study were that corn was very popular overall. Um, corn was clearly more popular than all the um, spring test diets. And it was at least as popular as all the fall test diets. Corn so, is king. Corn, yeah, as that's the name of the presentation we gave actually, is that corn is probably king. Um, so, I'm sorry, I need to find a way to turn this phone off. But what we found, what surprised us though, is that in every single situation, 100% of the earthworms were consumed, actually. There was never a single, even though we used as equivalent as we could, the weight of the corn and weight of the earthworms, we actually didn't have a single replicant or a single pen where there were any earthworms remaining at all. So with that in mind, it was kind of difficult to actually compare earthworm visitation or earthworm consumption to corn, right? Because if there's never any earthworms left, right, in the, the time where the pigs just have to start eating corn. Right. That is in the, in the trail cameras didn't help you tease that out. Oh, it absolutely did. Um, okay. There was definitely a time just watching the pigs at work. There, even after the worms were presumably gone, the pigs were still searching for them. You know, they would really? still root through the soil. They would still like, there was still a lot of activity in the trough that contained the worms, even though from what we could tell, there were probably no earthworms left by that left. point. And we say that because we would see the pigs root through the soil, but come up with no earthworms with in their no mouths. Earthworms. And was that both seasons, fall and uh, spring and fall, or was that, did that occur both seasons or was one season more common than the, uh, more, uh, more than the other? Well, you, I guess you only used it in the fall, right? Yes, sir, were only yeah. Used in the fall. Okay. So does this, does this suggest then that if people are wanting pigs to stay even longer in like you know if you're using one of those big corral type pens would putting earthworms in along with corn make them stay longer so that maybe the entire sounder would then go inside that's hard to say um i would shy away from using earthworms as a bait right now especially because it's a little unclear about what exactly about earthworms was so attractive to the pigs in this study right okay so it could have been that they're mixed with a fragrant soil. It could have been the very high protein content of the worms. It could have been the taste, the smell, or some interaction there. Um, just to give my thoughts on why the earthworms were attractive. Sure. It's unlikely to me that the protein content or the nutrient content had anything to do with it. Um, most studies that have looked at pig behavior um, and, and intake of different feeds has found that preferences for nutritional content can develop but it usually takes days, if not weeks, for those preferences to develop for a new, a, a novel feed, right? Right, right. So for a pig to associate earthworms with feeling good or feeling vigorous, it would take a, right. longer than five days for that association to occur. Right. So it's likely that it was more of the, the taste slash smell of these earthworms. Okay. And there's actually further research going on right now to try to find, to try to tease out exactly what it was about the earthworms that makes them more attractive to pigs because 
as you can imagine, buying earthworms is very expensive, um, sure. especially buying dozens and dozens of pounds of earthworms. It costs, you know, over a couple thousand dollars for that. Okay. And so if you're a wildlife manager, that's not exactly economic. Sure. But if we can use something like worm castings or something like that as a pig attractant, right. that could be very effective for future management. And that's some of the research that's going on right now, um, trying to find what exactly about the worms is attracted to pigs. Yeah. And I think, but this, but I think this is, and I'm, and I'm glad that that research is, is continuing here. And by the way, just to throw it out there, hey folks, you know, APHIS is paid for by your tax dollars. So when you pay your taxes, you may hate you may hate paying it, but at least, you know, part of it went to fund the study. So um, at least those of us in our industry, and this is important work, particularly for those of you out there with uh, feral pigs in, in your environment and you're doing some control on them. Uh, this is one difference with wildlife control operators is sometimes we have the resources to pay for more expensive baits because we have got to get rid of that particular animal. We may be in a very limited area and we have we can't make we can't just catch most of them. And so we may need to catch all of them. So even though the, it may be expensive, they just pass that right on to the consumer who's probably in desperate need right off the bat, or they would hold this back as a, a, a change up. Yeah. Like follow up, right? So where the corn is like, well, we're going to do corn and maybe we're going to try, try some of this experimenta experimentation. Where is your work going? So nothing came through as a shining example other than corn and earthworms and you're exploring the earthworms. Was there any baits that were just like, this is, don't garbage. even bother with this. Yeah, this is garbage. So let's, we have the best. Now let's talk about the worst. So the interesting thing about these baits is there wasn't a single one that I could fully count out after this study. And the reason for that is across the nine groups of pigs that got each test bait, the preference values, in essence, the ratio of test feed eaten to corn feed varied dramatically. For any particular test feed, you could find at least one or two examples where the pigs ate one to two pounds of the test feed. Meanwhile, you'd find another example where the pigs ate almost exclusively the test feed. So it was very, each test feed was very polarizing across these different groups of pigs. Mm. Uh, peanuts was a little more consistent, but even peanuts had individual pens where no peanuts were eaten. Some pens were exclusively peanuts were eaten. And that kind of brings us to another potentially interesting finding from the study. Okay. That bait preferences of groups of pigs can vary among individuals, okay. even within a, a similar geographic area. And so if I was a wildlife manager trying to use that to um, trap more pigs, I would experiment with bait mixtures, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, so absolutely. Just in my own trapping endeavors since the end of the study, because I still trap pigs as part of my work, I've tried mixing corn with various different crop, various different cereals like peanuts and soybeans and stuff. And I haven't done any kind of study on different mixtures of crops, but I have found that I do feel that when I use these different mixtures, I am getting bigger groups of pigs and pigs that are less hesitant to go into the trap. You think part of that is both the, the novelty and the variety, you know, like we, we all love variety that maybe the pigs like, well, this, I, I'm familiar with corn, but hey, what's this new odor I have here? Let me check this out. That's a fantastic question because a wildlife manager could easily turn that around on you and say, pigs are very neophobic. They don't like new things, right? Okay. But another thing we found in this study was that, as I said, we counted pig visitation to each trough over time. Mm -hmm. We did not find any variation, any variation in pig visitation from day one to day five. So they so were the, neophobic. Exactly. The baits that these pigs preferred, they took to first hour of the first day. They took right, right, right to it. And so with that in mind, I think it's totally within the interest of any wildlife manager to experiment with different baits, even in a trapping setting. Um, if a pig smells or picks up on something they like, according to this research, they're going to take to it, even when they could just go for the safe option that they know they've tried before and like, if that makes sense. Yeah. How far, do we have any research on how far a pig, how, how good can a pig smell? I mean, is it like a, like a bear I'm told can smell water a mile away or something? I think I've saw some where they will travel tremendous differences because of their, their nasal capacity and, and sensors. Do you, has there been any work evaluating, you know, how 
well pig smell versus to say a coyote i'm sure there has been uh, considerable work in that field it's not really my field of expertise okay. unfortunately i can say a little bit about pig biology and that's that pigs have their stand standard olfactory pathways like any animal does so mm -hmm. if i were to smell someone baking cookies in the next room i, I smell them with my nose right but if I got really, or if a dog or a pig or something got really close to those cookies and smelled that there was a little too much baking soda in those cookies, that's using the Jacobson's organ, right? Okay. So the Jacobson's organ is like, you could argue it's a stronger sense of smell than the smell. It's very good for not just getting the chemical composition of something, but if you've ever seen an animal follow a trail where it has its nose down on the trail, mm -hmm. it's using its Jacobson's organ to, to pinpoint the exact source of that smell and follow it. Pigs okay. have a very pronounced, very effective Jacobson's organ, but I, I don't really know how effective their normal sense of smell is compared to some other animals. I would imagine it's pretty effective having hunted pigs. Yeah, so um, because I'm just wondering how how far an odor would would pull a pig towards your trap. I mean, we always talk location, location, location. You know, never never rely on a bait when moving the trap to a better location would be a better choice, but there are sometimes you're not able to make you're not able to move the trap where you want it because maybe you don't have landowner permission and you're trying to pull that group of of pigs from an area just wondering how far you would be able to draw to draw them to the trap if if you were f off their main travel way as they're going from feeding area to feeding area I just that's just something i would be interested in finding out and uh, yeah, I think the research for that is still ongoing. Um, okay. So obviously, as you can imagine, getting real effective data from a study like that would require trapping pigs, collaring them, and getting some idea of how they normally move, right. and then how they move once this different attractant is put out. And that's actually, in my opinion, the direction this research should go. So we've done this research in a pen setting. We know that pigs will take to novel baits rapidly within a day or two. Let's take advantage of the space we have as a state or federal agency put pigs in a larger area, get that baseline data by collaring them in a, in a lab setting, getting movement patterns, getting that data down, and then introducing these novel baits to see how attractive these different baits are and how they affect pig movement. Okay. So the takeaways that I got from your research, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that corn is still king right, for the time being, right? Corn. Now, when we talk about corn, is there any preference are we looking at sweet corn are we looking at cattle corn Does whole, it matter? Kernel, whole, whole kernel corn used for cattle that's what we tested in this study oh, okay do you think sweet corn would have any better attractiveness because it's sweeter and higher sugar um i do i think it'd be a little more odorous which would be a little more effective for catching pigs i don't know if it'd be a particularly economic option right um, right it would, it would, it's hard to get sweet corn from a feed store and buy it in mass for right, right. The, the price that you can get whole kernel corn from but it right. would definitely if i was a wildlife manager who was struggling to get a particular sounder of pigs to go into the dang trap i would certainly give it a try okay and then you were also looking at mixtures and so would you suggest people trying, you know, having corn as the base of the mixture and then maybe adding in uh, vegetables or foods that would be local to the region that perhaps the person knew the, beer, the pigs were feeding on and then just sort of add that into the mixture and then use that as bait, bait piles? If that's an economic option for the wildlife manager, I would not be shy to try that. As this research found, pigs are not gonna be neophobic towards these novel feed sources. Okay. In my own personal experience trapping pigs, uh, again, we had to get rid of a lot of this bait once this study was over. And we did that by using it to trap pigs. We use it to mix it with corn, trap pigs doing that. And that was very effective. Um, we caught pigs very consistently using these different mixtures of, sometimes it was corn with soybeans, most commonly was corn with peanuts, but, if it's economic for the manager to try, I would absolutely experiment with different bait mixtures. Okay. And how much would you use 50% corn and then, or 75% corn and then add a little bit? What Do you have a sense for what your mixtures were just as a rough guide? Not really. I think the question would be more, how can you make these bait options that are a little more expensive than corn last as long as possible? Gotcha. Okay. And so if I was doing that, I would try to make... I would try to use five bags of corn for every 
bag of peanuts that I used. Okay, so if that uh, makes sense. Yeah, so the question well, of economics. Yeah, so we're looking at something less than twenty percent of the of the mixtures in. And of course, you'd reduce that a little bit more if you're adding more items in. So okay, so use maybe an eighty percent base of corn, and then play with some other items, and it gives you something to. Because wildlife control operators, in my experience, are great tinkerers and they're experimenters, and so this would be. Uh, it's it's amazing some of the re some of the things they find just anecdotal. A lot of them are very what I would call old school naturalists. They're just good observers. You know, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily using a scientific plan, but they're just out there watching animal behavior. And some of them are quite in tune. And they will try something, and then all of a sudden, bang! They find something that just hits hits for them. And uh, whether it be a trapping technique or or a baiting type situation. It's, it can be quite remarkable. It's amazing the amount of change that's occurred for such a fundamental industry. It's not like technology where it's, you know, changing all the time. We, we've, we've had some enormous advances in just the last 20 years uh, with equipment and baiting and techniques uh, for our work. So it's been, it's been remarkable. Absolutely. And so much of that advancement has come from the boots on the ground wildlife managers who are trapping pigs as their main line of work. Um, sure. As you've noted, pigs have incredibly complex behaviors. They vary throughout the year. They vary geographically. So it's really people doing research are really relying on these wildlife managers to give us these ideas of what could work, what could be effective. And then it's the researchers who pursue those ideas a little further. Now, your seasonality was focused on spring and fall. Do you think that there's any significance with pig behavior during summer and winter? Or are the big changes occurring to their dietary habits spring and fall? Because in terms of record keeping, wildlife control operators are not necessarily known for their record keeping. <laughs> um, they, you know, they... So if, if they were going to do a little experiment on themselves, would, would it just be the seasonality of spring and fall that they should focus on? Or should it be all four seasons to see if there's a change up in pig, di in pig diet, dietary behavior? That's an interesting question. So for this study, something I forgot to mention is that we actually uh, synced all the pigs we used for the study were female. They were of, they were not fully grown sows necessarily, but they were old enough that they could effectively reproduce. And all of these sows were synced with lutilase, putting okay. them all on the same hormonal cycle, essentially at the stage where they are ready to give birth, right? So that's what the um, that's what the what the lutilase does for them. Sure. And so, with that in mind, it was a bit difficult to tease out real differences between the winter, I'm sorry, the fall and the spring. The biggest difference I observed is that the difference between corn and the other test feeds was a bit more apparent in the fall than in the spring. In the spring, they were a little uh, closer matched, okay. but that could easily be because of we use different test baits. It could have nothing to do with seasonality. Right, okay. If, now, the females, do you think that there's, in, in, and it certainly makes sense for your study to focus on females. I'm glad we we talked about gender there uh, to because the females are king. I mean, if you can get rid of the females, then the pigs are gonna go away. And that's that's certainly what we would want. But do, do you, just in terms of your own personal experience, and I know this is anecdotal on your part, but we, that sometimes that's all we have in our industry is anecdotal information. Do you think that there's any feeding differences, behaviors between a male and a female, all, you know, all things considered? Or uh, what are your thoughts on that? There is absolutely a difference. Well, um, the is. main okay. reason being that the biggest source of pig mortality is going to be in those first few weeks when the piglets are first born. And that cause of death is mostly going to be protein shortages, just causing the pigs to just become enfeebled and pass away. Um, okay. That's a really big factor in piglet mortality. I don't think a study has been done to show that it is the biggest because, again, pigs aren't really a game species. So those kind of nuanced studies don't really occur. But it's been observed on private game ranches that in seasons where there's not as much accessible protein, pigs don't do as well of course most wildlife doesn't do as well right so with that in mind i would fully expect a weaning sow a sow who's trying to wean her piglets mm -hmm. would actively pursue higher protein options um how she detects a higher protein food versus a lower protein food it's hard for me to say because i don't think that 
research has really been done either. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be difficult for a pig to actually discern those differences just by eating a food alone. Right. But okay. If a pig was habituated to some higher protein option and had been around long enough to um, associate that food with higher energy, higher vigor, I do think a sow would be a bit more picky about the feed she goes for and actively pursue those higher energy, higher protein feeds. Yeah, so that would be difficult because they're having, especially for you southern states, they're having how many litters a year? I mean, I uh, up, up to how many litters a year? At least two, often three, if three. conditions are good. So you could have, so it would be hard to time, and is there any seasonality to that, per se? Yeah, um, it tends to be in the, the periods of time where the study took place in the early fall or early spring. Um, it's not going to be so much during the high summer or cold winter when resources are less available. Gotcha. Okay. So that those would be times when a trapper would want to be looking at having, uh, adding, trying to get some protein in there in, into the into the bait if possible, if he thought that that would be a way to, to get those females to be more attracted to those traps. That would be something that the, he would want to be able to try out on his own. Absolutely. And and worms, would worms cover that? Do you have any other ideas for protein sources? I mean, bacon, we've heard bacon here. <laughs> um, I, I'll leave that on its own. Um, but is there any other protein sources that you think would be suitable for uh, a bait just offhand? Hard to say. Um, I think I'd be open to any idea. Okay. Like I said, peanuts aren't necessarily the highest protein source, but just from the way the pigs behave with peanuts relative to how they behave with other test feeds, I do think peanuts were pretty desirable with these pigs. And so that'd be probably the first place I tried. They're also- Lentils? Lentils can have protein. Do pigs eat lentils? I have no idea. Um, okay. I don't think that's one of like, out of the research I've read that's looked at the most commonly targeted agricultural crops, okay. lentils was not on that list, but lentils right. are, also aren't the most commonly grown crops. Yeah. So. Okay, because we uh, question. just think it because we have lentils here in here in Montana because we we don't have pigs in Montana feral feral pigs in Montana but they're they're close so uh, but we're and we're kind of waiting we're kind of waiting when the day comes it looked like we might have had an incursion but where, wherever they are they're haven't been found uh, so but. Uh, we're we're waiting for the real incursion to come into Montana either along. Glacier National Park or somewhere in the northeast part of our state. So it's going to be interesting. I've been waiting for years. I'm surprised it really hasn't happened yet. So I'm really kind of shocked. Well, anything you'd like to add uh, that we haven't talked about that you want to be sure to leave with our with our audience? Um, I would be very careful. And again, this is not me trying to slam anyone, but I'd be very careful about using um, some of these name brand pig attractants that have become so popular. Um, there are things like beast attractant and different strawberry gel type substances that have been used to attract pigs. Mm. If you find that to be very effective in your area, keep using it. But from what I've seen in my personal pig trapping, I don't think it's necessarily worth the money. And right. I think a lot of wildlife professionals would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, if, so if, yeah, if you're using it, give it, you know, if you're going to buy one, don't buy a lot, sample it out. But, it, but in terms of some of this research, it just hasn't, nothing's panned out, but your context may be might different. Be di might be different. Be right? open to experimenting. Don't yeah, just be open to experimenting. Be a pig on the bottle and buy 20 gallons of it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's certainly wise advice. And I think that's fair, fair to say, because I found that sometimes when we make definitive statements, wildlife make a liar out of us. <laughs> <laughs> one way or the other no they never do that and then you see an animal do it and it's just kind of they always make a liar out of you in one way or another so Especially but yeah it, that's certainly that's certainly remember the bell curve everybody there's outliers that there's the bulk so we can't always rely on the outliers to be there for us <laughs> so well hey uh, uh lee we really appreciate you being on the on the show with us today and so i think you've given given our audience some important information corn is still king but you know but there's some other things you know worms we don't know why worms were attractive so uh, if you have ability to get some worms, you may want to play with that. But uh, but think about mixing, adding some mixtures to your to your corn, maybe up to twenty percent, and mix it up just to kind of give uh, give the 
feral pig some variety and, and experiment. Don't just simply rely on corn and don't mix your corn with diesel. Everybody you shouldn't be doing that. So be, be careful. Uh, diesel can contaminate soil and all kinds of stuff. So be careful out there with that. Uh, and we want to, but definitely try to try some things out and maybe you'll be coming out with the, the late great feral pig uh, bait that we're all searching for. So uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll get something marketed. We have a very creative audience in our industry. So we're really glad to have you on. Really have you. Well, everyone, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife Podcast. Do take a few moments, subscribe to the channel, drop me a line at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Tell us what you thought of the show, criticisms, comments, suggestions for free future shows. If you want to advertise, you can definitely reach out to me as well. We're always looking for people to interview with new ideas and subjects in this particular field because it's a very wide field and there's so much we need to learn within it. We'd be glad to have you on the show. That's how you can reach me. Do visit us on the Pest Geek Podcast on Facebook with our group, uh, your trials and triumphs. Definitely, we'd love to have you join us, join us there. And then, of course, visit us again next week when we have our next episode of Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Well, we call it Living the Wildlife because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.